Now, after their bruising election loss, the Labour Party is gearing up to choose a new leader to replace Jeremy Corbyn. Defeated Labour MPs and candidates say fundamental change is needed at the top of the party if it wants to win an election. And one of those aiming to take on the leadership role is Shadow Foreign Secretary Emily Thornberry. Emily joins us now. Uh, Morning. Emily, Morning. Uh, thanks for joining us. Now, I'm rather puzzled as to why there's not many people in your position or anybody at the Labour Party who's really thrown their hat in the ring. You're one of the very few at the moment. What, what, what's, what's been the difference? Why have you decided to throw your hat in the ring now? I, I, I don't understand it, to be honest. I mean, I tend... I'm really not the person to ask, am I? I mean, I tend to be fairly straightforward. I'm going for the leadership. I've announced all this kind of faffing around about, you know, well, I'm considering it and, you know, making soundings. Just either you're going for it or you're not. Mm. So, yeah, I'm going for it. As Shadow Foreign Secretary, as part of Jeremy Corbyn's top team for several years now, there yeah. will be those that are looking at you that are thinking, actually, you were part of the problem while it all went wrong. What are you going to be saying to them to prove otherwise? Well, I think the number of things went wrong, but not everything went wrong. And so I think that I would start with us voting for a general election when the general election was not a general election. It was a, an election about one issue, and that was about the issue of Brexit. And I think that it was a mistake for us to have gone for a general election on one issue. We should have had a referendum. I think we should have said to Boris Johnson, you know, if your deal is so great and you think that it is, put it back <laughs> to the people, find out if they, if they like it. If they do, that gets Brexit done. If they don't, that gets Brexit done. And then we'll have a general election. But I think that people were misled in the Labour Party into thinking that they could go into a general election when they weren't clear on the one issue that people wanted to make a decision about, and they thought that they could change the subject, which they couldn't. And I have to say, I did argue that <coughs> in Shadow Cabinet. I spoke to many of Jeremy's advisers and I, indeed I wrote him a letter saying don't do this and I'm afraid it was rather prophetic because when I read it now it's kind of what happened. But now it's not going to be about Brexit, it's going no. to be about all the policies that the country wants to get back to yes, and we did yes, hear about yes. some of those. We heard about the policies on education, on yeah. nationalisation for example. Are yeah. you standing by all of those policies? So I think the other thing that I think was a mistake that we made and I think that it, we have to admit that was that we put everything into our manifesto, a huge great wish, wish list which we couldn't possibly have delivered in five years and what you have to do is you have to be clear about what your priorities are and I think that Whilst we don't want to go back to the 90s, and we certainly don't want to go back to the 70s, there were some things that we did get right in the 90s. So, so the pledge card, where you have your five priorities, so that when someone is standing as a Labour, Labour volunteer on a doorstep, they can say to a member of the public, the five things that we definitely want to achieve are these, and these will be our priorities, although there are other things as well. But, but you generally agree with all the policies pretty much that... If Jeremy I look Corbyn at each individual for, policy, I think, well, I can see the reason for that, I can see the reason for that, but, you but know... Then, but then why, was... why, why would you be part of change, then? It's the thing I can't understand. If, if you're going to stand for exactly the same policies, the electorate have seen those policies, they've made a decision and they voted the Conservative Party, why are you going to be yeah. any different? What are so, you offering that's different? So I think that there is another way... It doesn't have to be like this. We do not need to have a Conservative government in the way that... and what the Conservative government are likely to do to our country in the next five years. And I think our priority is to make it clear that we are a competent alternative, that people can trust us. In the end, we want to have the opportunity to serve, but people won't give us that opportunity if they don't believe in us. Was it Jeremy so, Corbyn, then, that was a part of the problem? No, I think that... I think it's really interesting to look back at... The reaction of the public to Jeremy in 2017 and their reaction to him in 2019 and what went wrong in between. And I think one of the things that was really great about Jeremy was that he was authentic, he said what he meant, he spoke from the heart, he was direct. But I think over those two years, I think that the party lost its way and I think that Jeremy was badly advised on some of the things that just took too long to make decisions on or if we made a decision, we didn't implement it. And I think that this very kind of what they this phrase they use triangulation where like you want to be here you, you're here you want to go here instead of going here you kind of go you wander around mm. just just say what it is you want to do and just go for it and and that was something that Jeremy if, was good at when he first became leader but I do think that there were many people around him who had different ideas different frankly quite often to what Jeremy thought and were just badly advising him if, and we lost our way if you were leader would you have people like Rebecca Long Bailey who was a, a, a strong Corbyn supporter Angela Rayner you know would you have them in your cabinet 
What I would do is I would look around the Parliamentary Labour Party at all of the talents that we have, and we have huge amounts of talent, and many of them have been languishing on the back benches for too long. And what I would do is just appoint people on the basis of their ability. But uh, we know that Jeremy Corbyn does have an incredible amount of support within the party. Yes. I'm talking about momentum specifically. Yeah. Let's get to the point, actually. Momentum. Yeah. Would momentum still have a leading part to play in the future of the Labour Party if you were the leader? I've met huge numbers of Momentum members, and most of them are young, idealistic people who've come into politics in order to change the world. They are our lifeblood. I have absolutely no problem with them. I want to encourage young people to get involved in our party. This is a great advantage we've got over the Conservatives, who can't attract younger people. I think sometimes there's a slur attached to the idea of momentum. I don't have any problem with us having half a million people in our party that want to try to make Britain better. Yeah, but what about? Issue. Can I ask about the atmosphere within the party? Because you know, you yourself brought up trust. That's been mentioned as an issue. Tom Watson, the former deputy leader, for example, he talked about the brutality. We do need to be unified as a party and remember that we should be turning our fire on the Conservatives, who I think will be an appalling government in the next five years. And we need to be unified and remember that, yeah, of course there are little differences between us. Of course we'll have differences. But this on sounds policy. more like little differences. No, no, I get so. that. I get that. But you know. I mean, I think that Tom would agree that politics in Britain is pr pretty brutal um, and, and always has been. I mean, I, I mean, I've had examples of it myself and I know that it's, you know, I've, I've said publicly about some of the things... Well, for example, when I was first elected and I didn't agree with, um, with Blair about uh, in, incarcerating people for 90 days without any evidence and I was voting against 90 days detention, and I remember going into the lobby and I was a new MP and Tom Watson saying that I was a traitor. I mean, it, it, these things are brutal and people do get... People are very passionate, um, but there is... Sometimes it's used as an excuse for completely unacceptable behaviour and look, I, I mean, think that the culture is changing. Well, like the fact but, that no-one picked up the phone, it seems, to ring a number of these MPs who lost their seats. That was one of the accusations. Yeah. Well, I've spoken to a large number of MPs who lost their seats and also to a number of really talented people who would have been great on our backbenches, who would have been fantastic new MPs, who lost their chance to become elected because we made the wrong decisions when it went into the general election. We shouldn't have had a general election in those circumstances. We shouldn't have had an election with so many promises that everyone was bewildered about what the Labour Party stood for. And we should have been clearer about the kind of Britain that we want. But also going for the wrong seats as well was something that you talked there about. There were certainly... There were strategic yeah, failures as there well, strategic, there? Oh, there were all kinds of failures. I mean, I think we need to look very carefully at what we did, because we must never do this again. I mean, the next election in five years' time... But who is have to blame to for that, then? Who do you blame for those failures? Because you were part of that top team well, that presided over those failures happening. Well, I mean, I, I did everything that I could. I argued in the way that I did. I'm, I wasn't part of the election team. I was more than happy to well, play a part. you were barely visible, to be honest, within well, the election. Well, you know, I'm a team player and obviously... I mean, I would... Did they ask you to stand aside a little bit? I, I mean, I would tear my hair out morning after morning seeing, seeing GMTV and not seeing any Labour representatives. And I'd say... Good morning, Britain, oh, by the way. Sorry. I'm called GMTV. Sorry, for sorry. It's okay. Good morning, Britain. That's OK. If so, you're going to be a leader of any party, you need to know uh, that. Yeah. What I need, if I'm going to be leader of any party, is to is to appear on this programme on a regular basis and be accountable. But I was, throughout the election, saying, I'll do it. If you haven't got anybody else, I'll but do it. But why did and they the push you aside made... a little bit? It was... I don't know, it's up to them. And, and in the end, I'm a team player and I will, you know, I will do my bit. And I was there, I was willing, but, you know, it was a matter for other people to make that final decision. J just, the, I mean, the fact of the matter is the membership is the ones that are going to make the decision. You are going to need momentum on side. But the evidence, and we can see from the Conservative Party, the way Boris Johnson managed to, to, to get this huge majority is a certain amount of compromise in terms of, you know, conservative policy and his attitude towards some of those uh, communities up north. And they, and they, they really reached yeah. out to them. And, and the same thing's going to have to happen for the future Labour Party. We're going to have to see some compromise. But the likes of Alan Johnson's, they, they square the problem right at momentum. And that is your problem. However, you're caught now, aren't you? you? You have to have them on side. How are you going to reach that compromise? Well, I mean, we've, we've talked about kind of what momentum really is and the caricature of momentum, which I think is very different. I think that we need to be an honest and straightforward party and say that we have an alternative vision for Britain. And I think that if we say that in a clear way and we stick to our core values, I think there is something very attractive mm. about that. I think that we are a country that 
believes in looking after one another. I think that we believe in there being a safety net. We believe in being a country where there are opportunities, where everyone has a chance. And actually, that's really what the Labour Party stands for. And we need to make sure that we put that forward in a way that people can believe in. Mm. And if they can believe in us, then they will give us a chance. Another big issue to talk about is anti-Semitism and the accusations yeah. that Labour just hadn't dealt with it with enough force. The chief rabbi has said it was a poison sanction from the top that had taken root in Labour. What would you do to tackle this? If anybody in my party has behaved or said anything which is anti-Semitic, I think they should be chucked out. I think we should be, there should be no compromise on it. I frankly think that those, that sort of poison has no place in my party. My party should be much better than that and we need to be much stronger than we have been. So you think That's it's failed think. so far? Yes, of course it has. Of course it has, of course it has. And, and it's an issue that I have been banging on about, you know, for two, three years now. Since, frankly, I had meetings with the chief rabbi and numbers of other people from the Jewish community who were saying to me, Emily, we're really worried about what's happening within the party. And I raised it and I have been saying throughout, we must be much stronger on this because if the Labour Party has a place for anti-Semites, then it isn't the Labour Party anymore. So we who has allowed stop. that to happen? Whose responsibility is it that the Labour Party is in the situation it's in concerning anti-Semitism? I think that it was a question of just not being sufficiently strong. You know, I think that the, the will was there to, st to, 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 to not have a place for anti-Semites, but in the end, I think people were just too soft. And you can't be soft on an issue like this. You, you, there can be no place in our party for people who believe that you can treat others in this poisonous but way. Who, so you're then saying it's, it's more than one person who had this feeling then, who was too soft on it? Yeah. It's more than so I think that there was not a sufficient. I don't think that there was. I think that the party dealt with it sufficiently well. I think that we spent too long thinking, being complacent, thinking that it wasn't really that serious. I think we didn't put enough resources in it, and we weren't sufficiently decisive. And we should have had an absolute rule: we have no place for anti-Semites in the Labour Party. Full stop. So you're saying that everybody then has to take responsibility? Everybody in the Labour Party or at the top tier of the Labour Party has to take responsibility for that? I think that those who manage the Labour Party, which is a national executive committee, and the senior people within the party have responsibility for ensuring that the party is in good health. And it is certainly not in good health if we have people in the Labour Party who are anti-Semitic. So supposedly, you, you know, you'd be in favour of this, I mean, in all forms of discrimination. If you look back at someone's tweets, for example, if they've been anti-Semitic, then, then throw them out of the party. You yourself were found guilty some years ago of being discriminated towards a whole working class community in Rochester. Well, I mean, hang on, wait, whoa, whoa, no, no, whoa, no. whoa, 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 no, no, come on, let's, let's get, get this in no, proportion. No, but hang on. No, hang... What, we, what I did was, uh, during elections, I take a whole lot of photographs. I take photographs of dogs with rosettes. I take photographs of Dawn. I took photograph of a, of a house that had a whole lot of England flags on. Yes, months St George's after the, flags, yeah. 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 So, uh, months after the, the World Cup. So it was a, a series of... To see. Yeah, so there was a series of photographs that I took and this was one of them as an image from a from a by-election what I made the mistake of was then allowing other people to interpret what it was that I was saying and essentially what I did was I was told that I'd offended a whole lot of people I resigned I apologized so and why, I didn't you know so why did you apologize and resign if you're saying now because I apologize you... for any offense that that people felt that I had created by by taking that but photograph. you shouldn't have had to resign then in that case you should well, have stood, stood your ground then I'm a team player and I will never get in the way. Stand up for no, what you believe no, no, in, surely. No, 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 listen, listen to what I'm saying. The Labour Party, for me, is more important than anyone or anything else. I believe the Labour Party is the only vehicle for progressive social change in our country. If I was ever to get in the way of that, I will stand aside. I've said, actually, in relation to the leadership, if I'm elected to be leader of the Labour Party, and if after a few years it's seen that I might be a drag on the ticket in some way, I will stand aside, just like Andrew Little did why in the, the New Zealand but why, Labour why Party. Why wait? Off? I don't, I, I heard uh, just you say before that. the general election I heard you say in New that. Zealand, and then Jacinda became the candidate and won the next election. But, but why wait a few years? I mean, that's just a few. Well, why, I need why, a bit why, of time. Why, 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 I, I need you've a bit had of time. time. You've no, no, had no, time. No, no, no. You've been at the if very I, top of I, the Labour Party. If I'm leader of the Labour Party, there's a number of changes that need to be made, right? So we need to stop being quite as sectarian as we are and factional as we are. We need to bring our party together. We need to look again at the management of the Labour Party and what's happening in, in Southside, which is what our HQ is. We need to make sure that we're a proper campaigning organisation. We need to make sure that we put resources into the regions. There's a whole load of work that we need to do to make ourselves ready for a next general election. Now, 
That work needs doing, but if in the run-up to a general election, if it was seen that in some way I was less popular than the party, that my being the leader of the Labour Party would get in the way of Labour being elected, then of course I would stand aside. That would be Just like that Andrew be, Little that did. That would be disastrous. If you run up to a general election and the leader then resigns, that would be disastrous no, for the party. No, if, you, if you even think there's a chance of that, then why would you even put yourself in the ring? I, Listen, I think that the leader of the Labour Party, when we are in opposition, has the worst job in the world. I frankly feel that there are a lot of people in the media who will do everything they can to cut you off at the knees. Of course you are bombarded with all of that sort of thing. I don't think that it will stick with me because, you know, I am who I am and everyone knows, you know, there, isn't, there aren't any skeletons in my cupboard. You know, but I'm sure that there will be, there will be attempts made. And what I'm saying is that the challenge for me and for all candidates who would be, if they were to be leader, would be under that sort of bombardment. Mm. If, it's, if it started, if all the mud that was being chucked around started to stick and we were not popular, we should stand aside and mm. let someone else be the leader instead. One of the issues raised from that tweet, people thought it, had, it showed a snobbish attitude from you. They yeah. say that you're part of the elite, yeah, yeah. that you don't understand yeah. what the core Labour voters stand for. So... The thing is, is that people who know me know that actually I was brought up on a council estate. I was brought up on a council estate by a single parent. My mum was on benefits. But I had free school you're dinners. you're now a barrister. No, no, listen, listen. But, but it's what I you know are, about... a barrister. Well, hang you on. are part of the London elite. Let's, let's come on. You can't, yeah, you can't I, deny that. You I'm are part of the I'm not saying that I'm not elite. a successful your, woman. Your husband's a high I'm court not, judge. Yes, I'm not saying I'm a successful woman. I am a successful woman and I'm proud of being successful. I'm even more proud of being successful because... I had a few fights to get there, frankly. You know, when I was at my secondary modern, when I failed my 11 plus, the guy in charge of careers, when I asked him what he thought I could do with my life, he said, you can always visit people in prison. Well, I'm showing him, aren't I? Mm. No, good, I mean... I mean, I just, you know... Do you think, on the, on the <laughs> subject of being a woman as well, do you think it's important that the next leader of the Labour Party is a woman? I think it's important that the next leader of the Labour Party is the best person who's standing. Um, I do think it's starting to get a bit embarrassing that we've been going for more than 100 years and we have yet to have a leader of the Labour Party who is a woman, but in the end, it'll be up to the members to decide. You know, everything I've ever stood for, I've been to a hustings and the members have listened to what people have had to say. Do you have answers to their questions? Can you be seen as being the future? I hope that that's what people will decide. It'll be up to them. Mm, OK, and just before we let you go, because we should mention you had your own Christmas disaster, didn't you? Tell people what happened, why you've got a plaster on your hand, because we've just been talking about this earlier in the show when things didn't quite go to plan for some people over Christmas. This is so embarrassing. See, I, I've got a house full of family, I've got kids running around, I've got everybody, you know, and you'd think if anybody was going to end up at A&E, I didn't think it would be me. So I'm cutting the ham, we've got a really sharp knife, and I cut my hand as well as everything else. I ended up at A&E. I'm in A&E with my arm up like this, bleeding down my wrist. And somebody, very sweet person, comes up and goes, oh, it is Emily Thornbury. Oh, you look ever so much prettier in real life than you do on TV. And I'm saying, well, even though I'm in a state of shock, and she, I thought she's going to ask for a selfie. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But they were good. I'm stitched up. I'll get better. You know, it's All just better. like one of those things. The dangers of cooking ham over Christmas. OK, well, listen, <laughs> Emily, thanks very much. We appreciate you coming to see us this morning.